Good morning, and thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this is not therapy. This is kind of a psychoeducational lecture on various topics around relationships, addiction recovery, intimacy, healing, um, unhealthy relationship dynamics, etc. Um, whew, we are, what is the day today? October or something? Oh no, it's uh, May 13th, 2020. <laughs> It just feels we, like October, so. <laughs> we are two months into this. Um, just got off the phone with another therapist friend of mine, and we are all struggling. I mean, I feel like I can say that with quite a bit of um, confidence. Uh, even if you're not the ones struggling deeply with financial stressors or health issues, um, even if all the circumstances are advantageous to you in, in this environment, you're still struggling. Um, so of course, I always think of the, of the people, the families who were in marital crises in the process of divorce, in the process of discovery, the process of struggling for addiction recovery, and my heart goes out to them. So I just wanted to attempt another group on, I'm sorry, another webinar on helping everybody with resources. So kind of trying to find take some power back in this uncertain, chaotic environment uh, with giving you some very applicable tools to help you in these moments of tension, hurt, sadness, and struggle. And right now I'm seeing, you know, we have a huge numbers in this webinar, live webinar, who normally haven't attended this. So I think you are all taking, um, you're taking an active role in finding support, getting the help you need. I've been, I've been getting email, double, triple the amount of email regularly. So I do wanna honor all of you. Thank you for asking for help. Don't stop asking for help. We're all doing our best to provide you with the resources that we know of, or at least send you in the right direction. So all of you are present or watching this, you're definitely on the right path. So, um, I just, I was thinking maybe I'd kind of talk about what's going on for me to see if it's resonating with you, but I'm finding two months into this quarantine, I'm struggling with emotional instability. So what that looks like is um, I'll have a feeling or a moment, but it'll quickly change. So I will be feeling like everything's fine. And then I'll read an article or hear from a story from something and I'll find that it'll deeply depress me more than let's say typically hearing a sad story. Um, I find myself kind of fighting back cynicism, feelings of hopelessness. Um, I struggle to maintain perspective. I struggle to maintain gratitude. So those are things that I really feel like I have to dig really consciously and deeply for is to maintain perspective of um, what my real experience is and is my level of sadness or anxiety kind of, does it merit, is it valid? For, for what I'm currently experiencing right now. Um, Deb Dana, who's a, I'm gonna reference a new book that she just came out with. She's someone who works with Stephen Porges in the polyvagal theory. I did a group on that um, a couple months ago. It was, it's called How Our Nervous System Impacts Our Mental Health and Relationships. So if some of this stuff really resonates with you, I'd encourage you to go back to that video and kind of reference it. I'm not gonna go over the same polyvagal theory stuff, but basically, she talks about how trauma and our nervous system really struggles when um, the following four things are absent in, in our lives. And it's context, control, choice, and connection. So the four C's. It's basically saying right now we have no context. Our brain feels safe when it's predictable and reliable and we can quickly write a story around what's going on. And right now, we don't have that context. We don't know, you know, we're getting a lot of wide, varied sets of information that, you know, CS, the Cal State University schools just decided to shut down all in-person classes for the year. And yeah, the largest public college system in the world just said, we're not gonna be doing face-to-face -face classes in fall. And then you hear about the Florida beaches open and restaurants open. And so we're getting a lot of just different mixed information that certain treatments are working, 
certain people are vulnerable. Well, now it's a whole new class of people who are vulnerable. And we have nothing to kind of sink our teeth in to figure out how long is this going to go on? Um, is this getting any better? Can I dig up some hope from this? How do I keep myself safe? All of these things are unknown. So we are struggling with context. Um, control and choice are kind of the same thing. We lack a lot of choice and control in this situation. There are only so many things that we can do to manage um, global policies, pandemics. Um, it's, we really are struggling to find, we just are kind of getting little tiny opportunities for choice and control when the big picture is out of our control and we don't really understand fully what's going on. And connection. The biggest struggle with me on this is that the normal things that I'd encourage clients to do or people to do in these states of struggle, in these states of sadness or cynicism or loss of perspective or hurt or pain are not really allowed. I'd ask them to seek out their community get hugs and kisses from family and loved ones, um, go out and go to a restaurant, go someplace new, you know, all these things that kind of stimulate the feeling. We are social creatures. We have lots of neurobiological chemicals that come out that help us feel good, that help us feel regulated when we are in the presence of people. But right now, people, sadly, are triggering threat and danger because we don't know if they're carrying a virus that can harm us or loved ones or other vulnerable populations around us. Um, so we are lacking the connection that we all need from all this. So that's why our, our, constant, neuro, our, our constant autonomic nervous system is triggered in a constant state of threat. And so I wanna give you some kind of how to's of how to try your best to fight for these, um, what Deb Dana would call glimmers of moments where she can get back to what she calls the ventral vagal, safe, connected, socially engaged state. So I'm gonna reference this. I haven't fully been able to read this yet because I'm currently trying to um, run a business, do my job and homeschool three children. Um, so there's my cynicism, but <laughs> while my husband is also trying to do the same thing. Um, but I've been trying to go through a couple of versions of it. So if this stuff is resonate, resonating with you, I'd encourage you to check it out. What she just basically did is she wrote 50 very detailed, very doable, applicable exercises for you to do to basically build up the muscle of your, um, how to kind of move along the states of threatening situations. Because again, if you watch that video that I mentioned before, it's that our autonomic nervous system is unconscious, involuntary, and it is wired for one predominant purpose, which is to keep us alive. It runs on very little blood, very little oxygen, and it is just meant to read an environment and assess how dangerous is this, what's the threat level, and what do I need to do to stay safe? Um, so when you're in a ventral vagal state, it's maybe like what's happening right now, you're sitting here talking to me, we're having an engagement, kind of, I can't really see your faces. Um, but then something might happen, you, you read a really upsetting story, and you go into sympathetic state. That's kind of the, I'm, I'm mobilized, but mobilized with an agitation of fear of like, okay, what do I need to do to, to get myself safe? What needs to happen here? Um, and then the secondary state, or I'm sorry, the third state is dorsal vagal state, which is basically, I've assessed the situation, there's nothing I can do here, and I'm going to go into a full shutdown overwhelmed, underfunctioning, dislocation from the world um, kind of state. And so you might notice during these past couple months of quarantine, you've wandered between these three states where you have a ventral vagal, maybe you just get off the phone with a friend that you haven't been able to connect with and you talk about it and you guys laugh about commiserating during this quarantine and that's the ventral vagal socially engaged state. And then you slip into, again, like I said, you hear something really upsetting um, you look at your finances, you wonder if you're going to have a job and it triggers your sympathetic state of what do I need to do? Do I need to start looking for another job? Do we need to cut back on finances? Do I need to apply for these different loans and, and stimulus packages? And then dorsal states, you know, I've assessed all the situation and 
nothing is working out. And so I need to go in a room, shut myself down. I can't respond. I can't talk. I can't, I just, there's, there's nothing like my, my toolbox is empty and I'm unable to access anything. I, I mean, I hit that, like something happened the other day and I was like, I couldn't even just like bring myself to talk about things, process things. My brain just was like, one of those stubborn dogs that you're kind of pulling on a leash and they're just not going anywhere. And it was like, my brain wasn't going to do any of that. It didn't want to do any of it. And it was in shutdown mode. And I knew I had to give time and space to it because it needed to recharge its battery. <laughs> so anyway, healthy coping skills versus unhealthy coping skills when you're in these states. Um, what is healthy is anything that basically allows you to fully acknowledge what state you're in and kind of process all the thoughts and feelings that are happening. So stay curious. It keeps you in that executive functioning part of your brain. So what am I thinking right now? What happened that made me think this way? Where do my, where am I feeling it in your body? You know, therapists ask those really hippy dippy questions all the time, but it's because we're trying to keep you in your executive functioning part of your brain. That's where good choices happen. That's where impulse control happens. That's where we consider the consequences of our actions. As long as you stay curious, that's where you can stay. Um, what's the, do those thoughts that I'm having make sense? Um, a, am I, you know, what are they based on? Uh, what's the story that I'm telling myself? How am I feeling right now? What would I call that feeling? Where do I feel it in my body, et cetera? Um, and then, there is health, healthy, co um, sorry, healthy coping skills on besides like being curious and acknowledging it is to say, okay, so now I'm in this state of sympathetic or dorsal. So it's very highly uncomfortable. Um, this isn't working. Our, our goal is to not get stuck in any of these categories, right? It's the idea that it's, it's reasonable that you're going to slip into sympathetic, that you're going to slip into dorsal, but the goal is not to be stuck there and paralyzed. Like sometimes right now we all feel very stuck and paralyzed, but we want to find ways and, and kind of empower ourselves to know that we can slip in and out of a dorsal vagal social engagement stage, then in, in, in a, a kind of a mobilized with fear stage. And yes, we'll hit an isolated, overwhelmed, shut down stage, but we need to be able to bring ourselves back out again. And so what we also need to do is re realize what kind of things help us co-regulate. So use other entities to help regulate us and then self-regulate within ourselves to move ourselves up and down um, those states. Um, so maybe down-regulate high anxiety, high stress, high emotions, and up-regulate depression, um, hopelessness, paralysis, things like that. So I hope that makes sense. The way that I often talk about, and you can talk, go to all my previous 20-something videos that I have on YouTube, I talk a lot about sh uh, exploring and identifying shame voices, vetting them, processing them seeking empathy and compassion for those shame voices. So I'm not gonna go over those things. Keeping your side of the street clean. I talk about um, 12 step, but right now I'm gonna talk about just really basic go-to things that you need to, you are responsible for starting to chart this out and figure this out. In my group um, yesterday, um, an addict who's a recovering alcoholic was like, I need tangible skills. How, when these urges come, what do I need to do? And I said, yeah, we can definitely chart that out. But I'll tell you, if it's something that you've never done and you're going to try it right when you're at an urge, you're screwed. You practice when things are kind of annoying, kind of frustrating. So in the group that I had yesterday, understandably so, it got a little tense and crazy because we're all in an uncomfortable state. So then you use the skills in that moment, not when you're being drawn to go drink or go use your unhealthy coping skill of acting out or whatever. You use it in your, the presence of mind of, wow, that guy just talked really loudly to that person. That makes me feel really uncomfortable. What am I going to do? I'm going to do some grounding exercises. I'm going to do some deep breathing. After this, this is really intense. Maybe I need to go for a walk on the beach. Maybe I need to go journal some of this, right? It's practicing in the moments when you're also, when you're just slightly agitated and slightly struggling. So you're kind of drilled and have a practice ready and the muscle is kind of stronger to manage it when it gets more intense, more difficult when like, like I said, back when like my brain was in a state of shutdown mode, 
I knew that w once I gave it a break, I could go to the following, you know, mechanisms to try to get out of it further. So I hope you understand that. Don't take notes and think, oh, great, I'm going to save this for when S hits the fan. Uh-uh. Like, start these things today. Make a commitment and a practice to do them regularly so that when stuff really gets tough and you find yourself in a really bad place, you will have the skills to, to reference what works and what doesn't work. So I'll try to post a version of this, but this is a mix between engaging with other people or things in order to feel good and doing things for yourself. So there's grounding techniques and like, let me explain those really fast. Those are basically grounding techniques are what they sound like. Something allows me to feel like my feet are back on the ground. So remember trauma and struggle and stress gets, gets us out of reality. Um, you know, they say like anxiety is a struggle about the future, depression's a struggle about the past, and then the present is the present. So you're going into different places when you're in those states of struggle. You need to bring yourself back in this moment where your prefrontal cortex can make healthier decisions. So grounding's like, you know, what's my um, butt feel like against this chair? And um, what do I see around me in this room? Um, where, what does my body feel like? What does it feel like to put my feet on the ground? Um, how tense are my hands? Kind of things like that. Mindfulness meditation. I've talked about that more in detail and that's the hot thing right now for a reason. There's so much evidence based that it can help rewire your brains, rewire your autonomic nervous system. I'd encourage you to, to try it. I, I struggle to do it. I keep trying it. I keep trying it visualization. So again, just kind of closing your eyes to find yourself in um, a safe place, in a happy place. That's just resourcing to figure out, think of something calm. One of the things I like is the story that I'm telling myself in each of these states, right? So it's it really can be empowering when you realize that in each of these states, there's a different story that you tell yourself. And Deb Dana talks about it in her book, which is um, anticipating doing this podcast, for instance, or this webinar, is I am not in the greatest state right now. I'm quite drained emotionally, physically. And so I could choose different stories, right? So I could choose the dorsal vagal state of like, what's the point? Who cares? Like, I'm not good at this right now. I can't do it anymore. Maybe I should just quit my job. I don't think I'm going to be effective at this anyway, right? That's the shutdown mode, okay? Sympathetics, like, whoo, I think I'm going to screw this up. They're going to be making faces at me, judging me. I'm not really sure, like, how effective this is going to be. Um, I'm going to do my best. Hopefully, it's not too repetitive, you know. And then the ventral vagal story could be, I'm disheveled, and I'm in a state of struggle, but I'm guessing everybody else can kind of find some compassion and empathy in that state with me as well. And maybe the more real that I am about the fact that I'm struggling, the, the more that people will, it'll resonate with them and they can hear it. And, and maybe they can meet me where I am, which is that we're, we're not executing at our, our highest, <laughs> I'm not in my highest form right now. I'm just doing the best that I can with what the situation is. And um, there's a really big difference about what your body does in those stories right um and it can that's often what can trap you in that state for a long time so pay attention and i like doing those different stories to kind of check what state i'm in and what i'm what i'm telling myself and how it's keeping me in that state um body scanning progressive relaxation breath work dance movement tai chi kui gong i don't know what those are but i read that they're really interesting <laughs> They show up in a lot of the books by Bessel van der Kolk. So um, what it really is, is it's a lot of um, kind of complicated movements that really make your brain have to um, ignite to pay attention because they're kind of contradicting um, um, movements that your brain has to pay attention to in order to do. So it gets you out of your, your ventral, or I'm sorry, get you out of your sympathetic and dorsal state because you have to really engage um, prefrontal cortex. So I do kind of know what it is, just a little bit. Yoga, same thing, breath work, movement, body connection, pets, animals. These things are saving people's lives right now. You know, it's like, I, I kind of almost wish anyone who was 
quarantining in um, in a that are alone, like we need to be dropping pets off to them because they need something to hug, something to love, something to wake up and talk to you and all that kind of stuff because they're the best surrogates to human connection and sometimes they're the safest. So um, get yourself a pet <laughs> or don't. Um, exercise, obviously, sing songs, make music, dance to songs, play instruments, write a song, write a poem, do some kind of art project, do a craft, um, play a sport, ride a bike, do some talk therapy with your therapist, eat right. That's going to be a really big thing. You're, don't forget that this has a lot to do with physiology. Um, a lot of the, the physical consequences of being in these constant threatened states, um, there's going to be consequences to it. There's going to be digestive issues. There's going to be sleep issues. There might be chronic fatigue issues. Um, we really need to, all the things that we do have control of, how much we eat, um, or what we eat, how much we sleep, um, how much physical exercise we do. Um, we have control of that. We need to do everything that we can to mitigate our physiology because it's already kind of detrimented by being in this more threatened state because of this actual threat. <clears throat> Avoid substance use or substance abuse, please. This isn't the time to be numbing, um, numbing out. Journaling, uh, there's this thing too, there's uh, kind of this bilateral stimulation that stimulates your right and left sides of the brain. Um, I think it's like EFT and other things do like tapping exercises. I don't know if you can see me. Sometimes people find comfort in that. Sometimes they feel comfortable in like squeezing things or doing like these stimulations on each side. Um, so I'd, I'd ex encourage you to explore those. Journaling, gratitude bliss, talk to a trusted friend. Um, go out in nature, serve others for community service. I am just finished writing an article on step 12, which is, a, you know, of the 12 steps, which is just like, hey, I know that you're struggling with perspective. I know life's hard. You've done all this great work. Now go out and connect with other people. We are a, a species that needs to make meaning of all this. We need to write a story and make meaning about what this is all about and serving others, connecting with others, giving to others helps our neurobiology. There's just no doubt. Of course, it has to be done with boundaries. And if you struggle with boundaries, I have lots of videos on that too. But when you're in a state of struggle and you're struggling with perspective and gratitude, like I am constantly right now, I think, what have I done for other people? What can I do for others? And that helps you get out of your, your own kind of struggle and thinking about making meaning and, and purpose and stuff. Neurofeedback's really great. Social engagement, healthy and safe touch when it feels healthy and safe. Um, big sighs, ah, strangely. I feel like I'm like in drama school when I do that. But um, those actually will reset the, um, uh, your nervous system. Um, Screaming into a pillow, get a punching bag, attend support groups. You know, Tammy is going to list at the end of this some really great support groups that are there. I see a bunch of people are using them right now. Connect, 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 connect. It's even better if it can be face to face so you can see people's face expressions, you can see them laugh and smile. Um, the group where I work, my therapist group, um, they do like a weekly Zoom meeting where it was so funny for like Cinco de Mayo. They all wore like mustaches and hats and like all from their screen. It was just so funny to see. And they were laughing, like changing their backgrounds and screens. And I, I said, this is as close as we can get to social engagement. You know, you wish that they were physically in a room with you laughing, but it's, it's humans trying to adapt to the situation that they're in. And, and it was a moment of laughing and seeing them. And it was so funny. And so, um, do your best. Rocking in a chair, listening to podcasts, listening to, there's so much out there right now. It's, it's like, I can't get enough of what's out there. Free, accessible podcasts on any type of topic you could ever imagine that you'd ever want to know. Um, I think I mentioned to Tammy, I uploaded this app, Musician, where they teach you to play piano. I'm trying to learn to play piano. Um, art projects, 
where they send you like the art kit and then they do the the art on the t or on the zoom or the remote session with you i just please just see figure out what works drill on it see what's working see what's not working so then when it gets bad when you get to those dark places which you will if you haven't already entered them several times you can go to these places and i'm ready for any questions and any other ideas that have been working for you we do have some questions but you know i i want to share a moment of, sh of shame um the, the, this is a stupid story, but this is, you know, this is where I went to. It was, so I needed new shorts. So thank you, Amazon. And I got a you know $15 pair of khaki shorts and promptly spilled spaghetti sauce on them. So, so, you know, I, I tried to clean them and it hasn't worked. And I'm immediately going to, I'm such an idiot and I don't deserve, I'm seriously full blown into, I don't deserve to have new things, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then I went, you know, really really is this the best you know place for me to go and i thought you know my friend Kristen would talk about how shame is i seriously i did that my friend Kristen would talk about how the shame is really not so useful and and what else can i do so i want to put a new pair of shorts in my amazon cart and that made me feel better but but i was just like wow i spiraled down over spaghetti sauce spilled on a 15 dollar pair of shorts i mean it was ridiculous you know so but like but it was so i mean it, it was such one of those that wouldn't have normally thrown me no, you know for such a little so right but, but yeah it's like you know i just don't have the bandwidth um you know it, it, like more things cause me to you know oof. You're, you're absolutely right i had a, like my husband and i got in an argument about something and i again i'm someone who preaches on sh don't shame is unproductive shame is when it really got down to it why i was so upset is i went straight to like this is just another example that he doesn't love me um, you know, and, and again, if I was in a healthier state of mind, it would have just been an argument about the, the content of that argument. But because my mental health was already in like a threatened state and I was struggling, you're so right. Like it just shames like sitting there perched like a predator ready to take you out. And it's like, if it sees you limping, it just can take you out even faster. And it's amazing to pay attention to that. I've seen many marriages at that point get back together for the children. Let's I'll be honest. I, I've seen marriages get together or the initial thrust or incentive for them usually doesn't really have anything to do with love or wanting to be with that person because at that moment they might not love them and they might not like that person. And so sometimes all it just takes is, is maybe the history or the kids or the wanting a family system not to break up, that's okay, we can work with that. It just, it usually, it takes willingness and tenacity and accountability. Those are kind of the big three things that it takes. But the biggest problem is you need to be someone that you can sleep with at night. So regardless of what your partner has done to you with the lying and the betrayal, um, you still have to behave that at the end of the day, you know, I always say shame is constantly trying to convict us of being unworthy and unlovable. And it's always sitting there kind of watching your behavior, uh, calculating it, listing it, getting ready to pounce like Tammy and I were just talking about. And the ultimately you have to figure out, are you behaving in a way that is integrated with your values and goals? Because no matter what your wife chose to do and continues to do and the mess that's made, what are your goals? Who do you want to be? You say it's hard. It's really hard to stay in integrity when you're in such a threatened, upsetting state. But um, that's what will help you transcend this and survive it. There mm -hmm. are books about female, you know, addicts, um, which, you know, out of the doghouse is to cheaters and not necessarily you know, talking about addiction, sex addiction yeah. 101 in the workbook, which somebody else, you know, mentioned, um, you know, those are, you know, about addiction specifically, but, you know, um, uh, we have a number of podcasts and, um, and, the, and I just mentioned there's a male partner group, there's a female, you know, sex and love addict group. And there's mm -hmm. actually now we're going to start, we've got a new resource for female porn addicts, um, you know, we're going to have a meeting, a drop-in group for them. So, so there are resources 
Um, you know, I'm thinking too, like ready to heal and yeah. the making advances books. Those yeah. kind of collaborations. Again, those are more for people where this tends to be a pathological problem, like a chronic issue. But I do still feel like there are nuggets, you know, maybe the stories don't exactly line up that you had multiple affairs, but certainly um, it digs into like the trauma and figuring out who you are and what you need and, and communication and verbalizing all these things that are, are helpful for recovering post um, infidelity. Right. So yeah, I, I called my husband Bud this morning and he didn't like it and we fought for hours. Glad it's not just me. No, it's not just you. So you know, we're all, no, we're it's all not a just more you. Fragile. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, it's almost like we have to kind of treat it like we're getting a, a graduate degree in how to take care of ourselves when our body just kind of wants to pull itself into its t turtle shell and shut down because there's so many threatening messages going on. So we have to work even harder to stretch our brains and our physiology and our emotional capacities to, to still operate in spite of all these stressors and threatening situations and still do relationships. I mean, being able to have a healthy exchange with other flawed human beings is one of the greatest kind of symptoms of mental wellness, in my opinion, right? Like if you're functioning at a level where you can rupture and then repair relationships, struggle, but then co-regulate and help each other heal, that's kind of what life and, and wellness and balance is all about. A, there needs to be this grace and understanding that relationship dynamics are just, even the healthiest, strongest relationships are gonna struggle with this constant exposure to each other, to the flaws, um, to the irritants. You know, they're gonna, another human around you in this state is going to be kind of the lowest hanging fruit or quickest access to let you discharge your yucky emotions, if that makes sense, you know, like a husband or your children or something like that. So do know that it doesn't make it okay. When you do do it, you need to um, apologize, take ownership. And once you know better, try to do better. Um, but do have an understanding and grace that if I want to be loved for my shortcomings and my flaws and how much I screw up um, and be given grace, I need to do my best to extend that same thing to other people. Some, um, sometimes a crisis like this will just quickly bring up to the surface with what was already boiling underneath. And so don't completely chalk it up to like, oh, we're just in a threatened state. We need to pay attention to like the themes of what's actually going on that we're finding ourselves fighting about, um, the shame voices that are going on and those still need to be attended to. Um, but those are just all things to kind of be talking about and processing. Sorry. Um, I understand and I don't think you're crazy for wanting to reconcile despite the fact that she's harmed you or lied or betrayed you so many times. Um, so I hope you never shame yourself. You know, as Rob says, there's nothing wrong with loving people. There's nothing wrong with loving people and wanting to keep your family together. Um, it just can't be at the cost of your sanity um, and your health. So that's why boundaries are so absolutely necessary. You know, that other um, person who was asking questions, how we were saying, you look, you don't just give the person eight months of a break. During those eight months, are you doing anything and everything that you can to show that you want to reconcile, you want to heal, you want to repair, um, where you are being honest, you're attending meetings, you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing. And I mean, I hope I'm saying that thinking as if everyone knows what you're supposed to be doing, but um, in like sex addiction recovery, for instance, there's some pretty standard protocols of what people should be doing to um, stay healthy. So creating a new community of people, hopefully that are in recovery themselves, attending meetings, working the steps, having a sponsor, regularly checking in with these types of people, because the idea is, is is addiction is an intimacy attachment disorder, where basically I have made an unconscious decision, usually it's unconscious, to have a relationship with this acting out, you know, method, with this 
alcohol or sexual acting out or porn use, et cetera. I'm ha having a relationship with this because I know what I'm gonna get from this every time that I haven't been able to figure out how, what my real needs are within myself. And I certainly don't know how to ask for any of my needs to be met through a relationship with you. So, you know, I go to that bottle of Jack Daniels over and over again, because I know what I'm going to get from it. It also comes with insanity and hurt and lying and manipulating, but I am getting some kind of need met there that I don't know how to get met otherwise. So the work has to be done to help really figure that out of what, what was going on with you. And the 12 steps are a magnificent set of tools and pathway to start figuring that out. And then there's also, you know, certified sex addiction therapists and people who know how to walk people through disclosures, through shame resiliency, through healing, through rebuilding trust and all that. So there are patterns to healing. It's just a, whether or not there's willingness, there's surrendering and humility, there's um, tenacity to kind of hang in there and there's accountability on both sides. Speaking of resources, on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, there are a number of drop-in groups for male addicts, female partners, male partners, female addicts. You know, we, we have drop-in groups where you can see each other, you know, if you choose to turn your camera on, which we encourage. Um, uh, the webinars, you know, th this one, Dr. Rob, Dr. David, but there are more, including pro-dependence, you know, webinars um, and, and couples things, et cetera. So there's a lot of resources, you know, on, um, you know, on these. But I wanted to bring up to you on In The Rooms, intherooms.com, Dr. Rob and Dr. David both do um, their groups, Tuesday nights for Dr. David, Friday nights for Dr. Rob, but on uh, monthly and May 16th is the next one. We have a Super Saturday Recovery Summit. We'll have one June 20th, but there'll be one monthly. We started it in April, so we're committing now. Um, but it's a great opportunity to listen to you know um, experts present in a different way than is typical of their meeting site. But their meeting site, it, I, they've got tens of thousands of people that have connected on on that site. It's a it's a really good resource. So. I think we are out of time. Kristen, it was great to see you. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for being real, um, as always, you know, and uh, uh, thank all of you for joining us and um, come back next week. Eddie Caparucci, who I mentioned, will be on, and then Kristen will be back again on the second um, Wednesday of the month so that I'll see you in June and we'll see what We'll see what's happening. Yeah, <laughs> it's a sad, interesting milestone these days. So I wanted to say thank you everyone for joining. I'm so happy to see that the numbers are growing on these webinars. Please feel free to um, prepare some questions to ask me. They don't have to be about addiction recovery. They can be general. I mean, you could see the wide span that they, you know, they, they're varied questions that are here. And we're here for you. I mean, this is this is the hour to try to help everybody and um, tell some friends. There's no requirements of who can and can't join these groups. So right. please. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining.